On World News Tonight. Glimmer of hope. Indian rescuers drilled two-thirds of the way towards 41 trapped workers. Gaza troops. Israel and Hamas agree to a ceasefire paving way for some captives' release. Brain breakthrough. Australian scientists discover potential treatment for COVID-19 brain fog. And a dazzling spectacle. Starlings swoop through the English skies, mesmerizing the onlookers. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We begin tonight with a developing story in India. All hope is not lost for the 41 trapped workers and their relatives in Uttarakhand. Indian rescuers have drilled two-thirds of the way through the debris towards the workers trapped in a collapsed road tunnel for 11 days. Engineers were working to drive a steel pipe through at least 57 meters of earth and rock, dividing the trapped men from freedom. Excavators have been removing tons of earth, concrete and rubble from under the construction tunnel in the northern Himalayan state of Uttarakhand since 12th of November, when a portion of the tunnel collapsed. Rescue efforts have been slow, complicated by falling debris as well as repeated breakdowns of crucial heavy drilling machines. The giant earth boring machine last week ran into boulders and drilling was put on hold for more than three days after a cracking sound in the roof. Uttarakhand Chief Minister Pushkar Singh Dhami also stated that they achieved positive progress in the last 24 hours without further details. But a government statement also noted that timelines provided are subject to change due to technical glitches, the challenging Himalayan terrain and unforeseen emergencies. In case the route through the main tunnel entrance does not work, blasting and drilling have also begun from the far end of the unfinished tunnel, nearly half a kilometre long. Preparations have also been made for a risky vertical shaft directly above. Updates on the Israel-Gaza war front now. Israel's government and Hamas agreed to a four-day pause in fighting to allow the release of 50 hostages held in Gaza in exchange for 150 Palestinians imprisoned in Israel and the entry of humanitarian aid into the besieged enclave. Israel and Hamas have agreed on a four-day truce, according to both sides, the first in the war. The Israeli government voted in the early hours of Wednesday to back the deal which would allow the release of 50 women and children hostages held in Gaza. It also mentioned that for every 10 extra captives released, they would extend the pause in fighting by another day. In exchange, Hamas said, Israel would also free 150 Palestinian women and children imprisoned there and allow hundreds of aid trucks to enter Gaza. According to Israeli tallies, Hamas militants took about 240 hostages when its fighters surged into southern Israel on October 7th and killed 1,200 people. To date, Hamas has released four captives. Late on Tuesday, the armed wing of the Palestinian militant group Islamic Jihad, which also took part in the Hamas raid, said one of its Israeli hostages had died. Since the October attack, Gazan authorities say Israeli bombardments have flattened large parts of the Hamas-ruled enclave, killed more than 13,000 people and displaced about 2.3 million others. Before the deal was announced, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said U.S. President Joe Biden's intervention had helped to improve the tentative agreement so that it included more hostages and fewer concessions. But Netanyahu said Israel's broader mission had not changed. In a message at the start of the cabinet meeting on the deal, he said, We are at war and we will continue the war until we achieve all our goals to destroy Hamas, return all our hostages and ensure that no entity in Gaza can threaten Israel. North Korea stated that it successfully placed its first spy satellite in orbit and vowed to launch more in the near future, defying international condemnation from the United States and its allies. Japan's missile warning rang out in Okinawa late Tuesday after North Korea said it had launched a rocket carrying a satellite. Pyongyang claimed it placed its first spy satellite in orbit and vowed to launch more in the near future. Photos released by the North's state media appear to show leader Kim Jong-un overseeing a fiery launch of a rocket. Cannot independently verify the images. 
Hours later, Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida condemned the launch. He said at least one missile flew over Okinawa toward the Pacific Ocean and that the use of ballistic missile technology is a clear violation of UN resolutions against the North. Japan, South Korea and the U.S. could not confirm whether a satellite was in orbit. South Korea said it has now suspended part of a military agreement it signed with the North in 2018. Seoul's defense ministry said it would resume surveillance flights near the border. The North Korean regime is entirely responsible for the whole of this situation. And if North Korea makes any additional provocation, our military will immediately and vigorously punish North Korea based on the firm South Korea-U.S. joint defense posture. In a show of force, a U.S. submarine and an aircraft carrier arrived in South Korea. Analysts said the timing of this launch by the North is likely a tactical consideration as it tries to beat South Korea in succeeding in the military reconnaissance area. Here's Hong Min from the Korea Institute for National Unification. South Korea has been making significant preparations for launching a reconnaissance satellite by working on solid fuel space launches since last year. It appears that North Korea engaged in a competitive struggle with South Korea, a race for time, to showcase its operation of military reconnaissance satellites, possibly to avoid being preempted in the military reconnaissance area. Hong said he believed Russia provided some level of technical consultation for the North, but it may not have been a full-depth involvement in the design. Over in Liberia, President-elect Joseph Boakai's party announced that it was cancelling all remaining victory celebrations. A day after authorities said a driver sped into a crowd, killing at least three people and injuring 17 others. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Outside the party headquarters of Liberia's new president-elect, a burning vehicle and bloodstains on the floor. Two people are dead and 18 others injured, according to hospital staff, after a car ploughed into a crowd of people celebrating Joseph Boakai's election victory. It was not immediately clear if the incident was deliberate or an accident. Witness Winifred Mayers said the driver turned off his lights and drove into people. She added that loud music had stopped people from hearing what was happening and that there was no light for people to see. Two staff at Monrovia's John F. Kennedy Medical Center said three people were in a critical condition. Boakai narrowly defeated President George Weir in the November 14th presidential runoff. Weir conceded on Friday and urged Liberians to accept the result. A severe weather alert next. Searing crisis in South America as rain, flood and fire struck Brazil and Bolivia, navigating the nations to an uncomfortable terrain with unprecedented challenges. Firefighters face a mammoth task to control the fires, ravaging thousands of hectares in the north of Bolivia. Defense Minister Bondo Novillo stated that the fires have consumed over 3 million hectares of Bolivian Amazon. Weather forecasts predict heat waves for the next few days, which has prompted President Luis Arz to ask for international help to fight the fires. 30 Venezuelan firefighters arrived in Bolivia to support firefighting efforts, and French President Emmanuel Macron also announced that 100 firefighters will be sent to the Andean country. According to the latest report from the Bolivian Environment Ministry, over 127,000 fire outbreaks were detected within the course of this month alone. Meanwhile, Brazil grapples with dual climate extremes as the northern regions struggle under severe drought, while the south braces against the onslaught of floods. Let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Tonight's Road to the White House now. 
Vivek Ramaswamy knows he doesn't have the foreign policy chops of some of his opponents. He hasn't been a president, an ambassador, a senator or even a governor. But still, he wants to talk about it. At campaign stops in early states, Ramaswamy is urging voters to ask him about his foreign policy views. Ramaswamy's reluctance to leave his foreign policy unaddressed on the campaign trail comes on the heels of fresh attacks on the debate stage from rival Nikki Haley, who was ambassador to the United Nations in the Trump administration and was governor of South Carolina. After the attack, Ramaswamy shifted his strategy on the campaign trail. Previously, the 38-year-old businessman took questions from voters after delivering a stump speech without the subject matter suggestion. But now he wants to make sure his foreign policy stone isn't left unturned. Ramaswamy's plan to avoid the next world war relies on his non-interventionist philosophy and includes freeing the current lines of control between Russia and Ukraine. He's also promised to keep American boots off the ground in Israel or Palestinian territory. He has said that he and former President Donald Trump are the only non-neo-econ candidates in the primary, taking aim at what was the predominant foreign policy stance of the Republican Party, particularly during the presidency of George W. Bush. When the OpenAI board fired Sam Altman as CEO, he not only received support from employees, but from investors as well. Now, as per a development, some investors are exploring legal recourse against the company's board. Meanwhile, Microsoft has offered to match the pay of any staff who join it from crisis-ridden OpenAI. Some investors in ChatGPT maker OpenAI are looking into whether they can sue the company's board after last week's surprise ouster of CEO Sam Altman. That's according to sources familiar with the matter who told exclusively that the investors are working with legal advisors to study their options. Altman's abrupt firing by the board of directors has triggered the threat of a mass exodus of OpenAI employees. Investors worry that they could lose hundreds of millions of dollars they invested in OpenAI, with the potential collapse of the hottest startup in the rapidly growing generative artificial intelligence sector. OpenAI did not respond to a request for comment. The board fired Altman on Friday after what an internal memo called a breakdown of communications. By Monday, most of OpenAI's more than 700 employees threatened to resign unless the company replaced the board. Legal experts who said the structure of OpenAI would make it hard for investors to win a lawsuit against the board. Because OpenAI is controlled by a nonprofit parent company, experts said that gives the board a lot of leeway when it comes to leadership decisions. Also, OpenAI used a limited liability company as its operating arm, which makes it even harder to sue directors, according to one expert. The chief executive of Binance, the largest global cryptocurrency exchange, stepped down and pleaded guilty to violating criminal U.S. anti-money laundering requirements in a deal that might preserve the company's ability to continue operating. The head of the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange has reached a plea deal with U.S. federal prosecutors that will cost him his job and $50 million. Shangpin Zhao, the CEO of Binance, will also plead guilty to breaking U.S. anti-money laundering laws, and the firm he founded will pay a $4 billion penalty. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced the plea deal on Tuesday. Binance facilitated billions of dollars of unregulated cryptocurrency transactions. It willfully enabled hundreds of millions of dollars in transactions between American users and users subject to U.S. sanctions. And its platform accommodated criminals across the world who use Binance to move their stolen funds and other criminal proceeds. Lawyers for Zhao and Binance, as well as a company spokesperson, did not respond to calls for comment. The development is the latest devastating blow to the crypto world since the conviction earlier this year of FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried. Binance became the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. Now, Binance is paying one of the largest corporate penalties in U.S. history. Last year, that Binance has been under scrutiny from the U.S. Department of Justice since at least 2018. Tuesday's plea deal also resolves civil charges filed in March by the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. The CFTC accused the platform of failing to implement an effective anti-money laundering program to detect and prevent terrorist financing. 
The regulator wrote that in February 2019, Binance's former chief compliance officer received information on transactions by the militant Palestinian faction Hamas. Zhou, a billionaire who was born in China and moved to Canada at the age of 12, said the CFTC's complaint, quote, appears to contain an incomplete recitation of the facts, and we do not agree with the characterization of many of the issues alleged. We have some good news for you. There could be a treatment for COVID-19 brain fog in a few years' time. Researchers from the University of Queensland believe that they have a treatment for COVID-19 brain fog after successful trials on human brain tissue. COVID-19 changed the way we think, but this discovery could blow your mind. Infection with COVID-19 uh, increases uh, one of the drivers of ageing in the brain. Researchers from the University of Queensland using stem cells to grow the mini brains known as organoids before exposing them to COVID-19. They found the virus accelerates the growth of zombie or senescent cells, which naturally occur in the brain as we get older, leaving patients exposed to brain fog and memory loss. So they contribute to cognitive decline and, and loss of brain health in general. But there is some peace of mind, the research team finding a way to turn back the clock on the ageing brains, with certain drugs successfully destroying the zombie cells. There are some drugs that are called senolytics. These drugs selectively eliminate senescent cells, and that had been shown already in models of just ageing uh, or Alzheimer's disease. And this, some of these drugs are already in clinical trials. While it could still be years before we expect a widespread rollout of these drugs, this breakthrough is a significant step forward. That link between between viral infection and enhanced ageing of the brain is a potential worry that we should be looking out for in the future. The next steps to test brain tissue from patients who receive the COVID vaccine to see if that alters the growth of zombie cells. This is something that we definitely look forward to doing in the future. But that research will require further funding. But if you ask this team, it's a no-brainer. Welcome back. Spain's newly sworn in ministers attended their first cabinet meetings today. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world. In a non profit organization in Japan elevated Little Peking into a serious sport by hosting the inaugural Spogomi World Cup to collect trash in the back streets of Tokyo. Spain's newly sworn in ministers arrived at Mont Loa's palace to attend their first cabinet meeting after the consolidation of the new government. Dutch voters cast their ballots today in a nail biting election in which opinion polls show at least three parties, including far right, would hope for the top spot with no clear leader having emerged. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi held the first China Uzbekistan Foreign Minister strategic dialogue with Uzbekistan's Minister of Foreign Affairs Bakir Santov in Beijing. Mexican authorities stated that they had found 215 migrants, including minors, locked in Australia in the southern state of Veracruz. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight, we are leaving you in Preston as a flock of starlings was spotted forming a murmuration over England's skies. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.